Uh, but is it really going to create chaos? Now, another sports analogy. I like sports. What can I say? When you were kids, how many of you guys or gals played kickball, basketball on the street, play football, you know, whatever? Okay. How many times in those neighborhood games did you ever have a referee? <laughs> or a referee. You need to figure it out for yourself. So here's how, here's how it went down. Let's say it's a kickball game. You run to the base, the ball hits you, yeah, you're probably out. But of course you've got the argument. You're out. No, you're not. I was safe. You're out. You're safe. So for about five minutes, you argue about this. Well, ultimately, what happens? Somebody finally says, you know what, I was out. Because you don't want to argue about it anymore. I am not convinced that we would have the chaos that people are convinced that we would have if the state simply exercised their power to declare these things that are clearly unconstitutional. I mean, we're not talking about the states just deciding what they do and don't want to follow. We're talking about the representatives of the people elected by the people, serving in their legislators, looking and deliberating and saying, hey, we're looking at the Constitution, we're looking at this act, and it is not within these prescribed powers of the federal government. It's not chaos. That's what we want. We want there to be something. We don't want it to, to, to just run around and, and be able to do whatever they want to do because they say they want to do it. So that's basically where the principle of nullification came from. Jefferson and Madison, they articulated in these, in these documents. Interestingly, they sent it to all the other states, and almost all the other states said, we don't agree with this. Of course, most of the other states were controlled by federalists, particularly the northern states. But interestingly, within about 10 years, all of a sudden, the northern states discovered nullification and thought, hey, this is a good idea, because they thought that Jefferson's embargo, which basically was allowing ships to not go anywhere, it was killing the, the trade in the, uh, in the north, all of a sudden, the northern states that were opposed to nullification, all of a sudden they got on board. War of 1812, again, northern states, said nullification of federal conscription of troops. In fact, Daniel Webster of New Hampshire, who is not anybody that you would consider a grand you know, protector of state sovereignty, Daniel Webster wrote this during the War of 1812. He said, the operation of measures thus unconstitutional and illegal ought to be prevented by a resort to other measures which are both constitutional and legal. It will be the solemn duty of the state governments to protect their own authority over their own malicious and to interpose, there's Madison's word, between their citizens and arbitrary power. These are among the objects for which the state governments exist. Interesting, isn't it? We don't hear that part of nullification. All we hear about is that it was the Southerners that were doing it. In fact, it was northern states, I think, probably did more nullification than the southern states did. During the uh, Second National Bank uh, debates, Ohio, quote, recognized and improved the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions because they recognized that there had to be some constraint on federal power. And yet, we look at this, we look at the history, we realize that this happened some what, 60 years before the Civil War. Still, we get this constant idea that nullification is about slavery, and it was all about the southern states trying to protect slavery and keep black people in bondage. And this is patent, like, absolutely 180 degrees wrong history. It was, in fact, that Michael Bolden mentioned this earlier, the northern states that appealed to nullification to battle the fugitive slave laws. And Michael did a great job of explaining that dynamic. Southern states never appealed to the idea of nullification in defense of slavery. They didn't have to. It was the Constitution. It was the law of the land. What were they going to nullify? In fact, if you go and look, you can look it up online. It's called the, uh, the Declaration of Causes by South Carolina. It was basically a document that they wrote up when they were preparing to secede. It was their complaints against the federal government. You know what their number one complaint was? Northern states nullifying fugitive slave laws. I bet you didn't learn that in your history books, did you? Nullification is not about keeping people in bondage. Nullification is about liberty and freedom. It's about we the people reclaiming the powers that rightfully belong to us. Remember what the New York ratifying document said. We have the right to recall these powers whenever we want to. It's our power. 
doesn't flow down from Washington, D.C. This is about freedom, and it's about liberty. And I want to take just a few more minutes to, to share just a little bit of quick stories. This is one of my favorite historical incidents. I didn't even know about this until a couple of years ago, and I'm going to bet most of you don't know about it either unless you've been reading the Tenth Amendment Center website. How many of you have heard of Joshua Glover? A couple people. Joshua Glover was a slave in Missouri in 1849. A man named Benjamin Stone Garland purchased Glover. And Glover spent the next three years, he was about 30 at this point, we don't really know where he was before that, but he spent the next three years working on Garland's farm. Well, at some point, Joshua Glover decided that this whole slavery thing pretty much sucked. <laughs> and you know, it's interesting, and you need to think about this, in our, in our day and age, and, and with the freedoms that we have, we look at the whole idea of slavery and we think, I'd be out of there in a second. But we don't understand the courage that it took for that man to run away from, first off, everything he'd ever known all of his life. I mean, imagine picking up everything that you know, all of your family, friends, everything. I mean, it might be miserable, but it's a misery that you know, right? He took the risk to get on a barge in the Mississippi River and cross over and step onto free soil in Illinois. He left in March, not the warmest time of the year in that part of the country. He left with nothing but the clothes on his back. He walked some 300 miles to Wisconsin. Basically, depending on whatever he could scavenge for food. Can you imagine? I can't walk 300 miles. I certainly can't walk 300 miles without some food. Basically, all that he had to eat through certain points were some seed potatoes that were given to him by a friendly uh, farmer. He walked all the way to Wisconsin and set down roots there. He ended up getting a job at a mill, had his own little place. For the first time in his life, he got a paycheck for the work that he did. But he wasn't really quite free at that point. He always had to look back over his shoulder because like we were talking about, there was this fugitive slave law. And even though he was in free soil, he always had to be careful because somebody could come along and say, I own him, and drag him back south. And sure enough, this guy Garland, he was not one to let his quote-unquote property go without a fight. So he managed to track Glover down. And one night, with the help of another freed slave, which is the nastiest person in, the, in, in this whole story. His name was Nelson Turner. And he was supposed to be Glover's friend, but he had actually worked with Garland to help Garland find Glover. But they were in, the, in, their, in this little one-room hut one night. They were playing cards, drinking a little whiskey, and there was a bang on the door. And Glover said, hey, don't open that. We don't know who that is. But of course, Nelson knew exactly who it was. He opened the door, and in comes a federal marshal, a posse, along with Garland. Glover tried to fight back, but it clocked him over the head with a pair of handcuffs, basically knocking him halfway unconscious, bleeding on the floor. They drug him out of his home, threw him in the back of the wagon, took him all the way to Milwaukee, which was about 20 miles away, threw him in jail. But the plan was the next day to quietly expedite the paperwork and get him sent back, sent back south. Well, the people of Racine, which was the little town that he lived in, weren't real thrilled with somebody coming into somebody's home in their town and dragging him off, beating him over the head. And so they began to agitate, shall we say. And the newspaper editor there sent a message to the newspaper editor in Milwaukee and said, hey, they just basically kidnapped this guy here out of Racine. He's in the jail there in Milwaukee. What are we, what are we gonna do about this? Well, this guy, his name was Sherman Booth. And Sherman, he was an abolitionist. He cared about the freedom of this man. He took action, and he began spreading the word through his newspaper. That day, in the afternoon, they say about between three and 5,000 people gathered in front of the courthouse, which is where the jail was, demanding that Glover be let go. Three to 5,000 people in Milwaukee in the 1850s was a lot of people. Now, I can imagine if the AP was reporting it, they would say a handful of people right. gathered in front of the courthouse. <laughs> Well, there were speeches, and they were agitating, and pretty soon somebody said, we don't need a key. This guy picks up this big piece of lumber, he says, this will work as a key. <laughs> they broke the door down, brought Glover out to freedom. And to make a long story short, he was whisked off 
by carriage. He was taken to one of the safe houses of the Underground Railroad. He made a two-week trek, traveling about 200 miles to go about 12, and ultimately ended up at a warehouse near the, uh, whichever Great Lakes up there, which my geography is horrible, so I don't remember. But anyway, ultimately he ended up on a steamship and he was taken to Canada where he went and spent the rest of his life living in freedom. This is an amazing story to me. And it illustrates, first off, the idea of nullification. Because these people in Wisconsin, they didn't care about what this federal law said. They recognized the value of this man's freedom superseded all of that. And the really cool thing is, is that this guy, Sherman Booth, he got in a heap load of trouble, okay? Because he was considered the ringleader. And the federal government came after him. And he was ultimately convicted of violating the fugitive slave laws. He ended up losing his presence. He ended up spending time in jail. But it was cool because all along this whole path, the state of Wisconsin refused to cooperate with the federal authorities. They kept issuing a writs of habeas corpus and letting them go. He got arrested like four times before they were finally able to, to get the paperwork to the Supreme Court, which the Wisconsin Supreme Court said, we're not giving you this paperwork. You have no authority here. Pretty cool stuff. But the really neat part of this story is when you think about all of these people, these people that broke down the, the door of the jail, this guy named... This guy named John Merchant, who was the one who put him in the wagon and took him to the first safe house, who ultimately ended up also being uh, charged with violating the Fugitive Slave Law and committing suicide. You've got all of these people, this guy Sherman Booth, who stood up for this man's freedom because they viewed that as more important than this unconstitutional federal law. And to me, that is what the nullification movement is all about. That is what's important. We are fighting not, not just against some policy here or there. We are fighting for our very freedoms. Right. I'd like to close this little, this little section out with a, a quote. This is one of my favorite quotes ever that I've ever found. And it was also written by a former slave. You probably know his name is Stephen Douglas. Or Frederick Douglas, I'm sorry. And before I give you this quote, I want you to think about something for a minute. In, this, in the couple of the books that I read when I was reading about the history of Glover, it talked about when he got to Racine, in this little town of, in Wisconsin. For the first time in his life, he was able to go into his own home. Home. It's basically one room. But he was able to close that door behind him and lock his door. You know, only free people can lock their own doors. That is a symbol of freedom because it says, I can keep everybody else out. That's what people like Sherman Booth, the Wisconsin Supreme Court, James Madison, Thomas Jefferson, that's really what they were fighting for. They were fighting for our rights and our freedoms to have a lock on our door. But this is what Frederick Douglass he said. He said, find out what any people will quietly submit to and you have the exact measure of the injustice and wrong which will be imposed upon them. It's pretty heavy stuff. Right. Thank you guys for being here so much.